Hi, my name is Joe Murphy. I'm a co-founder of the Chef's Table Foundation and a co-host of the Chef's Table series. We're dedicated to using this show to bring awareness to the homeless veterans in the state of Massachusetts as well as in New Hampshire. Uh, we've been just invited into two cities and three towns and we've been told that there's a lot more interest. So we're offering uh, the homeless in transition veterans a uh, culinary school education. So having said that, I want to thank our chef of the night. Should I call you chef or officer? He's calling hey you. Oh, hey you. Our chef is actually a Boston police officer and he competes, uh, I don't know how many times a year. You travel to competitions with your wife, Ginny? Yeah, we do about 10 a year. 10 a year. And he's actually won a national award for uh, against the good old boys from down south and everybody that competes uh, for your pork. But is that correct? Yeah, we won um, in 2014. We won um, one of the New Hampshire State Championships, which allowed us to go down to Lynchburg, Tennessee, at the Jack Daniels facility. They run the World Championship down there. So there were 72 national teams, 20 international teams. Uh, competing in the four categories and like three ancillary. Uh, we were lucky enough to um, win first place with a perfect score in Pork Shoulder. So we're wow. um, Pork Shoulder World Champions of 2014. Wow, that's great. So, and as I talked to uh, Ed a number of times about this, you created your own rubs uh, and you know, the flavorings you use, is that correct? Yeah, we, um, we pretty much use, a, um, you know, a mother barbecue sauce, uh, which in every sauce for every category, there's four categories, chicken, pork ribs, pork shoulder, and beef brisket, beef brisket for the um, Kansas City Barbecue Society sanctioned competitions we compete in. So we have the, the mother sauce, um, which I'll show in a little bit, but that's all our sauces are based off that. We'll add different ingredients into it. Um, sometimes it would be sweeter. Um, ribs, is, ribs tend to be sweeter. The judges like sweet ribs, so okay. uh, so we'll change it around. Add, take some ingredients out, maybe add some more in. The competition, there's a lot more exactness and how you serve it to them, I'm sure, on flavors and the cuts of meat and certain, I guess I would say, uh, Types, for instance, a particular producer of a rib. Not, I don't want to name any particular company, but in competition, you look for certain producers of butts, ribs. Is that right? Right. It's it's half the battle is to getting quality meats. Um, you know, you get as, as as good a meat as you can. We'll, you know, get for chicken. We'll use regular supermarket chicken. Right. Um, for pork. Um, I buy, if I, if I could say, um, I just buy my pork, pork ribs, and uh, pork shoulder, it's the pork butt, which is the top of the shoulder, uh, at BJ's. BJ's, yeah. Local, local BJ's, and then the brisket, we go for the specialty cut, which is Wagyu. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows it, you ever, if you ever heard of Kobe beef, well, in the U.S. they have what is called American Kobe. What it really is, it's, it's a Wagyu cattle that they got from Japan. Wow crossbred with a black Angus. So it's more highly modeled than you can get from prime. So it's higher than prime. I think the Japanese scale is like one through 12. US prime would be about a five. Uh, the brisket we use is usually um, six to nine, seven to nine on that 12 point scale. So, so that is actually a tip. If you really want to, if barbecuing is a passion, then, uh, Chef is just giving you some great tips. The wet goop. Now, do you buy that in the supermarket or? It's we have it shipped in. We ship it in from to the house to, from Kansas City. But it's the the key. It's because it's the intramuscular fat is so fine. You don't have the big hunks of fat. You have that really fine fat. So if you're going to go buy ribs uh, or pork shoulder, pork butts, you're looking for not those big hunks of fat. 
Um, you're looking for the small little striations. Right, uh, right. And if you can't find uh, the Wagyu, is that what it's called, Wagyu? Right. Uh, we'll get you uh, Chef's email address, and then you can come get up at his house, I guess, right? We <laughs> don't <laughs> the whole we just cook regular choice. We don't need the specialty stuff. All right. Well, this show is designed to be instructional, educational, and, you know, we're gearing to the home chef. He's talking about some really rigid guidelines, and he's competing for a shot of Jack Daniels or whatever it is, right? A couple. Yeah, a couple. Okay. Now, we always talk about mise en place. It's a French term, and in professional kitchens, mise en place is the beginning. And it means everything in its place. So if you take a look here, we have a lot of ingredients. And Chef separated them because one has to do with the yeah. other. What is this? This is uh, all the ingredients in our base barbecue sauce, the mother sauce. The mother sauce. OK. Why don't we do this? Are we going to demonstrate putting the sauce together first? Sure. Okay, and then once we do that, then we'll show you how the different ingredients they use for rubs. And again, you know, he's competing, so he has certain blends that he likes to create, he and his wife Ginny. So you can get a lot of prepackaged rubs. Right. And again, keep this in mind, we talk about this in every show. You know, in cooking, it's a very creative process, and it's a passion, so it's T.T., to taste. So if you like a little bit more garlic or a little bit less salt or whatever you like, you can adjust recipes, even uh, pre-packets that you could buy in the supermarket. So what do we have for your mother sauce here? All right, we have, this is like basically a Kansas City style sauce, which is a sweeter sauce. Um, Memphis style is, is spicier. Um, this is the main ingredient in our sauce, and most barbecue sauces is ketchup. Ketchup. So we can okay. just add it to that. Sure. We'll just, yeah. And again, you know, if you want specific recipe, then that's fine. It looks like about a cup and a half here of yeah. ketchup. And I can, um, you know, put a, send it to you for the uh, for the website. Oh, excellent! Um, excellent. We have so ketchup. I believe it was uh, about a cup and a half. Yeah. Um, I think this makes maybe two and a quarter cups. Um, I would assume, by looking at it, it's probably a quarter of a cup of molasses. And that's the dark molasses? Yep. Okay. Now, if you want to pre-make a big batch of this, is that something you could keep in the refrigerator? There's not going to be any preservatives or anything no. like so that? So, normally, it, maybe 10 days in the fridge, I would say. Right. Um, probably longer. I mean, most of these ingredients sit in your shelves or sit in your fridge for months on end. Right. right. Um, but I think the, you know, safety-wise they say, you know, 10 days to two weeks, but, you know, we keep it several weeks right. in our fridge. Okay. Uh, we usually make bigger batches than this. Yeah. Um, this is just so if someone wanted to make it. Um, so you're eating barbecue a lot, though, is what you're saying. Well, I, I never get tired of it, but my family does. Right. <laughs> so when we all show up, then you've got plenty of sauce, right? I do. All right, good. All right, so what's the next ingredient? It's um, dark brown sugar. Uh, so we like it. This has that extra molasses, so it's like another batch of molasses and sugar. It looks like about a quarter of a cup. Yeah. Okay, I'll take those from you so you can get them out of your way. Okay. And then what else is next? This is maple syrup. Oh, okay. And we tend to use this if we want something sweeter. Yeah. Um, we usually don't. We used to add honey. And we like, like the maple, maple syrup. syrup. You, you, you get the sweeter flavor. The honey's really distinctive. Yeah. So Chef just gave you a great tip. If you want to start making your own sauce, 
then, you know, he's obviously tested many recipes and he leans towards the maple syrup. Yeah, right? we like it. We both, me and my wife like the maple syrup. Okay, taste. great. Uh, we have regular just mustard, yellow mustard. Oh, okay. That looks like a tablespoon. I think it was a, a little more. Half. That was probably, that might have been another one. Yeah, three we, can, we can give them that uh, recipe, right. so I'm just eyeballing it. I was trying to remember all the specific amounts, but I think we have like, a lot of times we'll bump this sauce up in competition with 21 ingredients, wow. and it's hard to remember the exact amount. See, my wife would know it because she makes it all the time. She makes all the sauces and all the rubs for competition. Wow. Which is a great thing for a husband and wife team. So this is, by smelling it, apple cider vinegar. Oh, wow. yeah. I like, see, I prefer, the judges love sweet sauce. I prefer spicy tangy. Yeah. So for home use, that's what I'll, I'll go for. Yes. Uh, Worcestershire sauce. Okay. Excellent. Now, again, remember, if there are certain ingredients that, you know, that you like, as Chef just told table. you, just adjust as you go along. And as you're mixing, you can always do a quick taste test. You know, you can say, gee, I'd like a little bit more of that maple syrup or a little bit less. So do it to your own palate. And that's what we did. We just, we just made sauces and rubs over and over and over again right. to come up with what we like the best. Wow. So. Okay, so what's next? We'll move along here. This is soy sauce. Okay. Now, I, in using soy sauce, I like the light soy sauce with the less sodium. It, to me, the flavor, just the regular soy sauce, it's just too dense. I like that lighter flavor. And it is your sodium also, so, you know, again, two taste. All right, what's next? Um, our old standby Heinz 57 sauce. This is probably a teaspoon, maybe? Yeah. We'll just add, and we'll add stuff to that. We'll add stuff like that, regular store-bought items to the sauce. It's, yeah, I mean, it's okay. liquid smoke. Um, some people don't like the liquid smoke. We like it. Right. I like that's, I mean, some teams will throw their sauce on the pit to get that smoky Smoke flavor. flavor. Right. Um, we just yeah. In the add it, and this is, I mean, this is, this is pretty much the sauce. Um, did you My wife came up with, and we got at the world championship. We got tenth place in the sauce, oh. so we got we got lucky on that one. Maybe yeah. we got a good table. Yeah. Um, this is garlic powder. It looks like a teaspoon. Yeah. Okay. Onion powder, another teaspoon. Yeah. Kosher salt. You know, I talk about salt quite a bit on the show. I'm glad that. Uh, Chef just talked about kosher salt. It's because the crystals are much larger than your regular table salt, it's much easier to handle so that you're not over salting. And you do, you wind up with less sodium because if you're using it and scaling it out, measuring it, because the crystals are larger, you're going to get less sodium because it'll take up more room versus the smaller crystal with the table salt. It seems to dissolve a lot better than yeah. table salt. Yeah, and, and the, I really believe the flavor profile on a kosher salt, a sea salt, is much better than a, a, a table salt. Yeah, any, anything that we make either has kosher salt or sea salt, never table salt. Right, good. Boy, well, you're really shut <laughs> uh, uh, We got uh, black pepper. Yep, that will of course. Yep. Okay. We'll do, we usually just use, usually use freshly ground yeah. black pepper. Mm -hmm. And then cayenne to taste, that's just optional. Mm -hmm. you, um, you like that a little bit of extra heat. I like the kick. It? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I like it nice and spicy. Okay, yep. so you pull that all together yep. and, and you heat it up. Yep, we heat it to a simmer. Um, usually like 10 minutes or so. Right. Uh, let it cool down. Yeah. And then you can put it in a, a jar, of, mm -hmm. you know, Tupperware type container and, and put it in the fridge. Yeah, I, I would think if you made this today, 
probably in two or three days the flavors would really come together and your sauce will be much nicer than just using it right away. Right, we always make our sauces for competition probably three days prior okay. to using them. Okay, good. Uh, everything gets better the next couple of days. Yeah, so that's a great tip uh, Chef just gave you. You know, in competition, he'll make it three days in advance. And, you know, it's like that homemade soup or the beef stew, it's always better the next day. And I would think this is the, the same. Yeah, you can tell the difference. It gives the flavors a chance to kind of mellow together. Okay, great. So that's your sauce. We're not going to cook it all, but we wanted to at least give you an idea of how we put together. And as he said, you know, this would probably be holed up for 10 days. We're coming into the barbecue season. And look, if you don't like your sauce and you try it three or four times, stop down Ed's house. <laughs> just, just find out what time he's eating and... And even store-bought sauces, and you, you know, you like something but it's not sweet enough just to add. You, if you like honey, you can add honey or, like, or add maple syrup. I or add brown sugar to it. Brown sugar is always uh, a great addition to a barbecue okay. sauce. So Chef just gave you another tip. And I, I do want to ask you one other question. When I said we can come down to your house, you kind of dance the way. <laughs> Everyone's welcome. Oh, okay. <laughs> fine, fine. Okay. You know, Officer, Officer Roach, he is such a great guy. And I had the chief, who's right under number two, under the commissioner, come to speak at our, our local Rotary Club. And I didn't know this, Officer Roach was his partner in the drug unit? No, we used to work together in, uh, in Dorchester, in Do years ago. Yeah. And, and I said to Ed, I just can't, you're so nice, I can't imagine you having to <laughs> deal with these real gangbanger, drug guys, and he said he has a switch, he just flips it and puts on the old mean face, is that what it is? Yeah, most, kind of, most, if you, most police, police officers in Boston are personable, nice people, they're like your brother's sister's mother's father, so they're just regular everyday people that just happen to have uh, you know, law enforcement as a job. My father was a Boston police officer, so I grew up with one but I never got that smile. I always got the, <laughs> the look, I call it. The look. You never laid a hand on me. Didn't have to just give me the look. It was a different academy we went to. So. Oh, okay. All right. Now, uh, Chef is going to show you how to uh, take a, a fresh and how you inject it. And yeah, we can. Um, I get. I have a rack of um, already cut St. Louis herbs or. Um, the pork butt. Uh, in okay, there. do you want to show the butt? That, sure. That'll be a little bit more. So, if we could have the butt, do you want to grab it or is it sure. here? Sure. I'll grab it. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a family show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I always put my gloves on. Um, in competition, you require. Yeah, yeah. You're not doing that. <laughs> In competition, we're required to have gloves at all times. You can't handle any food without gloves. If they catch you um, just handling qualified. food, you're disqualified. So, Good. food thought, safety at all times. I thought you were just going to tell me you're on the alias of Dr. Goldfinger. All right, down here and grab me. Like I said, this is um, it's part of the shoulder. So this is half of the shoulder, the top half. Uh, what they refer to as the pork butt, Boston butt. Um, and the lower shoulder would be the picnic. the picnic. So you would see in the stores and we'll say um, picnic on it um, or picnic shoulder. Right. And uh, I say this uh, quite a bit. I'll tell people I'm legally blind. So uh, BJ's provided all the meats that we're cooking tonight. We're very grateful that they did because we have an audience and we're going to feed them. So uh, I was over at the meat case and Ed was working, so they said it's right here, and I grabbed the picnic because I did, couldn't didn't read the label, I couldn't see the label, so we had to go back into the store, return them, 
and if you are looking for a pork butt, it's a better taste. Yep, the, the, the meat inside, it's more, um, more fat yeah. uh, in the muscle you can see on camera. Um, this is, compared to a picnic, there's a, a lot more fat going through this. Mm -hmm. um, there's certain portions of this is, you know, the most flavorful part of the shoulder is this portion, which in competition they refer to as the money muscle. The reason they call it the money muscle uh, is because if you turn it into the judges, you're in the money. Uh, it's the most tender, most flavorful. You can see this is, it's really dense uh, striations of fat going through it yeah. uh, as compared to the rest. Uh, sometimes you'll see, uh, and you can usually tell this section as opposed to the, uh, the other end with the, the horn muscles because you can see the bone. The bone is on the, on the other side. Right. Uh, this is a bone in uh, pork pot. But we turn these in sliced. We'll cut this off and slice these, and it will pretty much have the appearance of a pork tenderloin. Oh, wow. Uh, and the rest is uh, pulled or chunked. Okay. Yeah, and, and I do want to mention, we talked about this a couple of days ago, the bone-in really adds a lot to the finished product flavor. Yeah, I, I don't, we don't know of any teams that do um, boneless. Oh, boneless. boneless. Right. They don't, we, well, in competition, we inject everything. Yeah. Um, we only have one bite to impress the judges. Oh, okay. So we gotta pack as much flavor as we can uh, into each bite. Yeah. Uh, so we inject all our meats. Um, sometimes we put multiple rubs on it, different rubs. Wow. Uh, well, if we could demonstrate the injection sure. right now, because we're running down and sure. time here. So moving along. Well, this. And just quickly, this is the fat cap on the butt. Um, competition, we leave it on to protect it. Yes. Uh, at home, I cut it off because I want the rub all around the meat. So yes. um, you can see there's, there's, the, there's, the, sure. there's the fat cap, and then there's a thin layer of meat there. Yeah. And that's what they call the false cap. Okay. Because below it, there's another layer. So you're going to cut through both of these into that layer and just leave a, you know, just an eighth of an inch thick. Um, just so you can get rub all the way around, because most sure. people use, turn it into pulled pork. So the bark is the flavor. Yeah. The bark is just the crust form from uh, the rub and the interaction uh, with the moisture and the meat. So Chef just gave you a great tip that, uh, repeat, I can't remember what you just said. <laughs> so yeah, you just want bark all the way around, because yeah. the seasoning is flavor. Yeah, um, and the bark is the rub. The bark is the rub. It just that's what they refer to it when it turns into that crusty nice. goodness that right. that forms on it after it's been you know yeah. slow smoked for hours. Okay, if we don't get done quickly, they're gonna be back. All right, <laughs> all right. So, so um, very clever, aren't I? We except we don't we don't have the injection yeah. made. It's over here. I can throw the ingredients yeah. together really quick. Okay. Um, I'll just go back over here. Yeah. So, um, anyways. We I use, guess you can get this in a specialty store or... You can get it in a, some supermarkets, some form of a marinade, they call them marinade injectors. Yeah. You can buy these in supermarkets. Okay. Um, this was like at a sporting goods store. So, yeah, you can get them, it's, you know, any, anywhere they have like camping stuff or, yeah. wow. uh, or in supermarkets where the utensils are. Sure. Some of them, are, you know, might have plastic um, needles on them, but... Okay. Um, we'll just do this real quickly. I probably won't, I probably won't be able to put the whole thing in, but this this usually I think this the seven ingredients here. The main ingredient is white grape juice. I was just going to ask you. It looked like a, almost looked like a ginger ale, but I can understand. And then we, we use we use peach nectar. That's wow. Because um, peach and pork, I guess I can just yeah put this down here. I love that. I um, love peach. We have cider vinegar. Um, just seven ingredients total, uh, kosher salt, and we'll kosher shear. We'll have these recipes for you on chefstableseries.tv and you can get these recipes. Yes. And it's, you know, again, you can adjust, so don't stop. Okay, so, and we have uh, onion powder and garlic salt. So you would just mix these up. Um, you don't have to mix them up that good. Uh, what you would do, yeah, you usually, you just draw the syringe back. Um, just pretend you like a vet, 
veterinarian. And you would just inject into the meat. So we usually inject right into the muddy muscle. Uh, you just push it right in there. Um, and you'll know, you can see slightly, it will, it will, it will start to expand. Yeah. Um, some of the injection will come out, so I'll just hold my finger there for a second. Yeah. See how it expands. Pull it out and hold it there. It should stay in. These uh, pork butts will hold two cups of, of injection easily. Wow. Um, That's a great tip. If you're curious how, how much to put in, the chef just told you it'll hold up to two cups of liquid. And I'm sure it keeps the meat moist, even though you have that right. back, and it look, might look like it's burnt. Right. We have an optional ingredient on this um, is MSG. Um, and MSG is just um, it's just an, it's you know it enhances the flavor of uh, right. what's already in there. That what they call it umami. Yeah. It's like that that right. that X, the fifth taste or whatever yeah. it is. Because um, most of the, most of the time when you taste barbecue, you're really only tasting salt first. Yeah. Usually sweet second, and heat is the last thing that hits your tongue. Cool. Um, <clears throat> and you can, yeah, you, you can tell. Once you eat it over and over again, the first, first thing you get is the salt every time. Yeah. Uh, and then the sweet right afterwards. Wow. Um, so yeah, you could just, what I do is I just inject this all the way around. Um, you can tell that this, this won't go all the way through. Yeah. What, what I do when I put it on the, on the pit at home, uh, is leave that because it's still a tiny layer of fat still on the bottom. Yeah. That's like a you know a bowl or uh, it will hold that injection in there. What we do is we inject these um, eight hours in advance. Wow. And then we'll put some seasoning on it, just a light amount, maybe sometimes moderate amount depending on the cut. Yeah. Risk it takes more. Uh, and then we'll wrap it in plastic wrap and put it in the fridge mm. and let it sit it's for sure. eight hours. What happens is the meat uh, draws the salt into it. Yeah. Uh, well, initially the the salt pulls the moisture out, right. and you can see it looks like the meat sweating. Right. And then as it's sitting there, it actually pulls the salt back into the uh, meat to right. help season. Chef just gave you a great tip on the salt will come out and it'll look like it's sweating. Yep. And then just leave it because you want that to go back into the meat. And I noticed, uh, this is my own observation, with the vinegar, that's a pH which will probably break down some of the, any yep. type of... Uh, yeah, it will help break down the connective tissues and the collagen that's already in the meat. Yeah, so it's really worth using two cups so that you really have every area of the meat. Right, because the flavor only goes on the surface. Uh, even with, you know, a, a bunch of rub on it, you're only going maybe a quarter inch into the surface. And you see this is a big hunk of meat, it's probably like nine pounds. Yeah. Um, putting flavor, especially we like, it's majority uh, white grape juice and peach. Mm. So it's a really sweet, little yeah. bit of saltiness yeah. to it. Um, it really adds a ton of flavor and it complements the pork. And the cooking time on this, you know, butts are a good sized chunk of meat. But when you're cooking, I'm sure if it's 10 pounds, when that's done, you're probably down to seven, seven and a half pounds of meat. Finished. Yeah, it's usually whatever it weighs when it goes in the pit is about 60% uh, yield, okay. sometimes 50, sometimes it's half the size. Wow. So, you know, we'll throw in sometimes um, in competition 18 pound briskets and we have seven pounds of usable meat at the end. Wow, wow, that's great. These things will cook. Um, it's tough to do it on a home grill or in the oven. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easy to do ribs. Yeah. In competition, these cook because what we do is we foil it, add extra ingredients because we're trying to layer the flavors yeah. so the judges get that one bite and, right. and say a while. So yeah. um, we braise this at the very end, which is just wrapping in foil, adding some ingredients, adding a little liquid, and it's just barbecue braising at the end. Um, so it's kind of like throwing it in a crock pot. It's, this, it's a similar thing. Yeah. Well, I'm guessing, you know, when you're competing nationally and when you first get started, because there's a lot of technique and technical uh, information that you've been giving us. And did you hear people in the background saying, look at that dumb old Yankee? <laughs> how, how did that work? That's what, yeah, we were down um, when they saw because we had the banner showing we're from Massachusetts, yeah. and they were coming by our site saying, um, you know, 
y'all um, from Mass Massachusetts, y'all don't know how to barbecue. Right. So I guess we had the last laugh. <laughs> Very good. Now, all right, it's injected. Yep. You're going to plastic wrap it. Yep. Put it in the refrigerator for at least eight hours. Yep. Well, at least an hour. We do it eight in competition. Um, we hook, run the pits at 250 for the bunts. They usually run about 12 hours. Um, so you could do it. It's tough to do it in a, on an oven if you want to run it that long yeah. or a grill. But ribs are great. Ribs, you don't have to have a smoker. Um, you could do it in your oven. You can season your ribs. Um, baby backs, uh, which are really loin back ribs, um, which are from the, the rear, your back. Yeah. Spare ribs are from the front. Um, you could two and a quarter hours for baby backs, um, two and a half hours of spare ribs, wrap them in foil for like an hour, throw some apple juice in there. Um, after an hour, take them out, yeah. throw some more raw butter, maybe some you know, dark brown sugar, 30 minutes, take them out and sauce them, they should be done. Wow. Now, all right, eight hours for competition, and I think I would want to do it for eight hours, even for home use, because all that flavor is going in there, you've got the pH working on the connective tissue to tenderize that. Then you put a rub on this? We put the rub on right, be right after we inject it, and then right before it goes on the pit, about take it out for like 45 minutes, let it kind of come up to uh, warm up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, put the rub back on, make sure you see that sweat again, yeah. and then it goes in the pit. Okay. We runs about eight hours, and then we'll wrap in foil tightly. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll braise it for a couple hours. Wow. Run this to about 190 degrees. Right. Uh, until Usually, it's I'm so you really need the some the chef just gave you a tip, but you're like a machine <laughs> here. There is so much information. And uh, so you inject it, you put the rub on, and you let that set for the eight hours. Yep. You only have an hour, that's fine. An if you have hour, a half hour, right. so if you want to do it right before it goes to the pit, that's fine. Yeah, and then you put another yeah. rub on. And then we'll just recode it, recode it, uh, and then throw it on. Excellent. If we can just quickly, because we do have the mise en place for the rub, we don't have to put it together only because of time constraints. Sure. But uh, if you could step over here and just talk to, you know, again, mise en place. There are two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, be 14. Thirteen, fourteen. 14 different ingredients, and this is your dry rub. Yeah. So do you just want to top line it and sure. mention what they are? And okay. I'll step over, let you get over there. All right, so we have, um, this, we, this, we just made this so, it's, I'm assuming about a quarter of a cup of turbinado sugar. We like turbinado, it has that molasses-y kind of caramel flavor, and it doesn't burn as easily as okay. like regular sugar. Yeah. Uh, we do uh, light brown sugar. We just use the, the horrible stuff. It's easier instead of drying the sugar. Yeah. Uh, paprika, chili seasoning, uh, black pepper. Then we have kosher salt, garlic salt, onion salt, celery salt. We like to flavor. Add the, we're going to add salts. We'd like to add the additional Good flavor. flavor. Yeah. Um, and then we do. Um, um, go ahead. Um, it's the yellow mustard, uh, cumin, uh, garlic powder, onion powder, and um, cayenne. Excellent. So you can see there's a lot of mise en place, and you should do what we just did. That's a, if you're scaling out, getting ready to put everything together, it's good to separate it. So get some throwaway little plastic dishes or whatever. And then you just combine it quickly. You could use your hand, actually. It's probably the best way to do it. But with that glove, yeah. and uh, if then you can just coat it, right? And it is easier to do it like this because you can tell by 14 ingredients. If you're halfway through, something distracts you. Right. You're like, oh my god, what did I put in there? What and, do I have left? And that's why mise en place was invented. I think I invented it, but I just I <laughs> can't remember. But you're right. If everything is scaled out, then you're not going to miss an ingredient. Okay. Or, or double up on one right. that you didn't want to. Right. Yeah, and and you know, a sign of a great chef is having continuity and flavor and just continue to repeat that great recipe. So this will also help you in your cooking. And 
this has been great. And, and there's so much information that he gave us. Uh, if you want, again, to re-watch this show, uh, you can go to Chef's Table Series TV and you can re-watch the show, get the recipes, and then you get everything, your mise en place ready, and then you can cook right along with the chef. He gave you a lot of great tips today. And uh, now that I have them here, and we always have an audience, so if you're interested in a restaurant in your town, you'd like to see it filmed, uh, we're always looking for restaurants, so please contact us uh, on our website. You can reach out to us. but. I just think it would be great to have a series of barbecue shows. And I've been asking my new best friend, <laughs> Chef Ed, if he would consider doing it. And he just, to smile, that's all I get. So I told him 40 shows a year, and he did comment like four or five days later, yeah, 40 shows a year. So in commercial television, a series as I understand it, it's usually 25 shows, and then they'll repeat them for the back half of the year. So, we do have an audience here tonight. What do you think? Don't you think we should do it? It has been said. <laughs> Let it be written. Let it be done. <laughs> All right? Okay. So again, we want to thank you for watching the Chef's Table Foundation. If you have a friend that's a veteran, a family member that's a veteran, or an active duty, we want to thank you. And our mission again is to support homeless U.S. veterans in transition with a culinary school education. And we're hoping, it looks like we're going to definitely do two starting in September and maybe a third. And uh, by having the audience here supporting our work, it, it just helps us to achieve our mission. And having great, you know, people in the food business are very giving people. And particularly, you have two stars because you've been in the service business for 29 years as a Boston police officer and you, you're here sharing your knowledge and we appreciate that and we can't wait for the 25 show series to begin <laughs> thank you very very much i might have to wait till after i retire <laughs> well again we want to thank bj's for supplying all the meats and the products that we're serving here tonight and uh, we want to thank uh, you, the viewer, for watching and supporting us. Uh, we are at the Sons of Italy Lodge in Roslindale. They are our host, and we want to thank them because they let us keep our studio equipment here, and they let us use the hall. So we're grateful to the Sons of Italy Lodge in Roslindale. And again, we'll see you next week. And welcome to the craft beer pairing on the Chef's Table series. I'm Carol O'Connor. I am here with certified Cicero and Kesley Roth. So today on the show, you saw Ed Roach, who is a Boston police officer, make St. Louis ribs with pulled pork. So I asked Kelsey to choose, I mean, I'm sure there's tons of beer he can choose, but which one he prefers to pair with those meats. So I went with, uh, this is Bone Shaker Brown Ale from Moat Mountain. Shaker. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and you know, it's got the, the reference right there for right. St. Louis ribs and bones, but uh, mm -hmm. so it's a brown ale, mm -hmm. and this is my favorite style of beer to pair with barbecue uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's got a really nice kind of toasty character to it, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit nutty um, and a little bit sweet as well, and those flavors just go so well with barbecue, barbecue sauce, a little bit of uh, you know smoke from the grill. Um, yeah. This has you know it's not super dark. It's got a, a nice kind of amber, uh, kind of dark mm -hmm. amber color. 
And if you smell, it's got a nice kind of mm. sweetness to it, almost like a caramel, caramel yep. sweetness. But it's also not heavy. Mm. You know, it's got like a nice little it has a um, tang to it almost. Yep, I taste it. Um, and this, this because of those uh, light toasted roasty flavors, mm -hmm. uh, just go really well with like a nice seared meat. And uh, the kind of light body is going to be really nice with the mac and cheese and the, oh. and the creamy coleslaw. Yeah, the mac and cheese so, is excellent. Uh, another reason I went with this beer mm. is that it's Moat good. Mountain, the brewery, is also a smokehouse. So oh, they, good. The, they can actually go up there and they do their own barbecue as well. So if anybody's going to know how to do beer for barbecue, it's going to be these it's guys. These guys. Yeah. Perfect. Good mm -hmm. choice. And the beer is delicious. They'll definitely mm -hmm. go well with those meats. Yeah. He, he loves... He loves barbecue, mm -hmm. so it was really good. I do too, maybe yes. a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> I love the mac and cheese, I don't eat meat, but this will definitely go well, definitely. So everyone, this has been the Craft Beer Pairing on the Chef's Table series. I'm Carol O'Connor. And I'm Kelsey Roth, a proud supporter of the Chef's Table Foundation. Welcome to the coffee segment on the Chef's Table series. My name is Carol, Carol O'Connor, and we are here at Rick Creole Coffee and Roastery in West Roxbury. And I am here with owners Hector and Miriam Morales, and we're going to talk about beans. I didn't know there were so many different beans, and they're all different blends, different mm -hmm. shades of them. Yeah. Well, these are actually um, roasted. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're not blends because remember they're single origin. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so you learn everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know, this is the different roast that we do here at Red Creole. Um, we start with the green bean that you saw with our roasting. Um, and it always starts green like this. This is what we bring from the farm. They're hard and they're smaller. As we roast them, we roast in three different roasts. We roast a light roast a medium roast and a bold roast. And as you can tell what, you know, the different shades, there are different temperatures that go into there and different timing that go oh. into that. And the last one we have here yes. is our decaffeinated. And one thing we do here at Recreo is we don't do the traditional decaffeination, which is through a bleach um, wow. to, to take out the caffeine. We send it to Swiss Water Company in Canada. And what they do with the Swiss water is they decaffeinate the coffee with water only. So there's no chemicals added. They put them in, um, in big pools of water for 12 hours and they abstract the caffeine through wow. that filtration. But you, so you can tell we roast our decaffeinated in mm -hmm. a bowl roast. Um, but oh. you can see the, sh you know, the, the different shades. Yes. Um, I don't know if you know, but the lighter the coffee, the more caffeine it has. I didn't know that. And a lot of people oh think, oh, this is a strong coffee, it's bold, so it must have a lot of caffeine. It's the other way around. Always Our lighter, that. you know, this one is a lot more oily mm -hmm. in the coffee because it roasted longer. Okay. And so let more caffeine comes out of those beans as they've been roasted. Wow. And so here we go. This is the three roasts that we offer here at Recreo. And this, this is the bolder taste yeah, the though. Bold taste. Yeah. Yet the light roast has more caffeine. Mm -hmm. Right, wow. right. So people, wow. The thing is that as you roast, yes. the bold roast is at a higher temperature for a longer time. So all the heat goes to the core of the, of the bean and it cracks the core. So the oils of the, of the bean and the caffeine flushes away mm -hmm. a little. So that's why it has less caffeine than the light. That is but the the flavor is a, is stronger. It's a strong flavor, right. and because we're single origin, it's a bold roast. It's very smooth, very mm -hmm. mellow in its finish. That's a characteristic of single origin coffees. Oh, so, so the guys, Hector, I'm going to have to try the bold. I'm so always Carol, going. Carol, go for the bold. I'm going to have to go for the bold. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for that. I'm going to try that the next time, definitely. So everyone, this has been the coffee segment on the Chef's Table series with Recreo's um, owners Miriam and Hector Morales.
And we, we've done different treatments with asparagus after harvest. Uh, this is some of last year's, that's not asparagus, that's milkweed. But uh, the asparagus looks about like that. These stalks, so they'll grow up like that into the pretty ferns. And we try to nourish them for the summer, and that's what replenishes the nutrients in the root for the next season's crop. Uh, and then we just planted a new bed up the road a little bit this year. Uh, that's the third time I planted what I thought was going to be my last bed. <laughs> and this year we put a drip irrigation line underground in with it. It's a little plastic tube. It's down about six inches in each row. And we can water it uh, right in place without uh, sprinklers or anything. And it's very important to uh, have good growing conditions after the harvest because that's when you're growing the next year's crop. So the irrigation we figure we'll be using mostly in uh, July and August when the harvest ended the middle of June. And it's very unlikely we'd have to irrigate during harvest because it's a very deep rooted plant. And it does like to be in a sandy soil. You can see this is kind of a dry field and it's about perfect for asparagus. It doesn't like to have wet feet. Harvested in a year in their prime season. Oh. <laughs> um, for well, consumption. For consumption. Yeah, let me think about it. Probably uh, probably six or seven thousand. Six or seven thousand. Wow. That's for the year. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a lot of work. Yeah. In a very short period right, of yeah. time. Right, yeah. Well, I'd be happy if we did that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, asparagus is supposed to be great for almost anything that ails you from high blood pressure to impotency or stupidity, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but it does have quite a variety of minerals and vitamins in it. And, uh, Do you sell the plants at the farm? No, no. Oh. We, we buy our plants and we don't sell them. I meant to the public. Right. No, it's a little hard because uh, you can't store them very well and have them go out healthy. Uh, we buy them out of cold storage when we're ready to plant, and they go right in. Oh. Well, actually, this field, when I planted it the first time, I started from seed. Uh, you can do that, too. I planted, I bought a pound of seed for, I think it was $450. In uh, February, we planted in the greenhouse, and we had some real deep six-inch cells we put them in, and we let it grow in there for about four months, and then we transplanted them out. Uh, since then, we bought crowns. They're a little more expensive, but it seems to be a good way to do things. Um, how, how do you get purple like That's a purple. different variety. We grow some of that. There are purple varieties and green varieties. Yeah. So how old are you, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> 80. 80? 80. Wow, yeah. you good, huh? <laughs> Is that the There's <laughs> <laughs> the one question that usually comes up that nobody's mentioned. I don't know. I'm surprised. I always associated with asparagus. A green pea? A smelly pea? You're getting close. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say smelly tea or smelly pee? pee? pee, pee. Yeah. <laughs> That's apparently the folic acid. And I don't know how many of you notice it and are aware of it, but uh, after you eat asparagus, the next time you pee, it's going to have a very different aroma. <laughs> and it doesn't matter whether you do that in 15 minutes or 10 hours. It's still going to be there. But I, I think some people felt that that was cleaning some stuff out of your system. I don't know. <laughs> but it's the folic acid that 
does that, I think. But uh, it is, it's a big chore going through because they, uh, when they're harvesting, I didn't bring a basket, they have plastic pails they carry on a belt and a asparagus cutter, which most of you would know is a dandelion cutter. Now we, we grow about everything from asparagus to zucchini in the vegetable line and uh, we'll be picking radishes to be the first new crop in another week or two. Of course we've been doing asparagus for three weeks now and parsnips, uh, we overwinter some parsnips in the ground and we're finishing those off now out of storage. And that's one crop you can leave in the ground over winter and it comes out better in the spring than it was in the fall. Wow. That's the only one though. Yeah. <laughs> Carrots look about the same but it won't work that way. Well we can probably head back if uh, nobody has any more questions here. Yeah? We'll all just keep right on going out the other end. Yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah. You can if anybody wants to you can hunt down the row here and find a couple and snack on them live. Now I got a crew of really good workers. Yeah. They've been with me a long time and Got a nice kind of sweetness to it, almost like a caramel. Yeah. Yeah,